All right, good evening, everyone. Tonight is Tuesday, May 7th, 2024, and this is the Teaching and Learning Committee meeting of the School District of Waukesha Board of Education. Can we start um, by verifying that the meeting was properly posted? Yes. Thank you. Our first item of business tonight is approval of the Teaching and Learning Minutes from the April 4th meeting. I move to approve the minutes as presented. Thank you. Second. Seconded by Mrs. Kozlowski. Um, I should acknowledge that Mrs. Koenig is excused this evening and welcome Mr. Brooks to the, to the team. Um, all right, moved and seconded. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstained? Okay, passes 4-0. We have an opportunity for the public to speak this evening. Did anyone sign up? Okay, thank you. Moving on to board policy 5460 graduation requirements. This is a follow up um, from last month. So discussion and possible actions. Ms. Skennerman. Good evening. Um, like you said, this was a policy that was discussed last month. Um, one of the reasons we're bringing it forward is because of the changes that we are making in financial literacy. Um, on the first page of the policy, you can see that the chart was changed to reflect the requirements for um, any classes, graduating classes beyond 2028. Um, that was shared and discussed last time. Um, one thing um, we discussed last time is some of the language that you see on the second page regarding um, any of these letters, A, B, C. We talked a little bit about math. Um, in talking with our teaching and learning team um, a little bit more, we felt it was probably best to just come forward today with the changes on the first page for the chart. And then since that impacts students for next year, just allowing those courses and we've already started to communicate, but just to ensure the policy is in line with that. And then to really um, spend a little bit more time aligning some of the statements um, in addition to the, that's on page two of the policy, um, just looking for parallel structure, just a little bit more coherence uh, with that, but just needing a little bit more time, but not wanting to hold up the changes with a graduation requirement. Thank you for the update. So I think we're just back to the Act 60 updates. Mm -hmm. um, I was kind of looking back at the history of revisions of this policy and it, it gets tapped quite a bit just because of the changes and how we roll out the curriculum. Um, so I think it does make sense to take some more time to think through all those letters. And I, I think it's, it's unlike some of our other policies that just don't even have that structure. So it'll be good to revisit that. So we're simply looking at changes that are highlighted in green on the table on the front page. Any questions about that? Sorry, I thought it was Thank presenting you. prior to. So um, it is there for you to view, but you can also see it in Bard Docs. Anyone care to make a motion? I'll motion to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, passes 4-0. Thank you. Our next um, item under general business is an update to our three-year library plan. Just up. <laughs> and we're back. So um, earlier this year, we had brought forward um, discussion and final approval for a three-year library plan. This was something that we did not have in place prior to bringing this forward this year. Um, I've worked with the library media specialist. Um, at the time of our meeting in fall, Melina Copleen, who's one of our library media specialists, joined us and was able to talk a little bit more specifics with the plan. Um, as promised then, we wanted to come back and just share an update uh, with the board regarding the work that's been done this year so far in regards to our library plan. 
Um, as you recall, our library plan really is meant to be a rolling document. So we had it for three years, so it will always be three years. So this is the time of the year where we're saying, how did we do? Did we successfully complete some of those strategic actions or not? Or was there a pause that we needed to have? And then take some time to connect and reflect on what are our next steps in these areas for next year. Um, so what I'll do is I'll jump into the first area that's a priority area for us, and this would be collaborative leadership. In this area, uh, one thing we wanted to focus on this year was really strengthening our, lead, our collaborative leadership with other groups um, around the district. Um, so what we've done is um, we wrote these strategic actions, and you can see that um, our priority was to work with instructional technology coordinators just to make sure that we're collaborating and speaking the same language, especially when it comes to resources that can be shared with staff. Um, we also wanted to really strengthen our partnership uh, with other um, coordinators for ELA um, and that sort of thing. So here you will see some of our strategic actions around collaborative leadership and just our organization of meeting with other people to ensure that we're collaborating with others. This was a change because realistically, like we have um, five librarians and so sometimes they didn't know right away if we had new curriculum coming. Like the board just approved the new elementary library curriculum and so now right away we have there's regular meetings, so that can be discussed in collaboration around how to share those resources, collaborate together to meet the needs of students. So we've put some structures in place. Um, you can see in semester one, um, right away, the very beginning as far as the job description for elementary education assistance was changed. We're on target, so that is complete. Um, some of the things down a little bit lower are in progress. One of the things we continue to do is um, sending communication out to our families. Um, I just, uh, our spring one is going out this month um, from all our building principals. So that was done in collaboration with the library media specialists. Um, they work on drafting um, things about um, library books and deadlines, um, but also uh, then we collaborate with our principals and ask them to send it out at you know within the same month. Um, so that is still in progress. That is probably something we want to comp continue as our library plan continues in the future. Um, it's just been a nice way to communicate with um, families regarding some of the library resources or reminders. Um, one of the things that is currently in progress at the very end is research solutions while educational aides are out for extended absences. Um, this uh, was one piece that is in progress and um, not that we're at a pause, but we are considering a pause on this because we're just not sure um, what our options for next steps are. So as you know, it's sometimes hard to fill positions um, within the school and other business areas. Um, our library aides do an amazing job in our libraries to make sure the libraries are open. And our library media specialists, um, when, when needed and when they can, they do fill in for the library aid at a building. Um, but sometimes there's not enough people. And so unfortunately, sometimes we do have to close a library from time to time. Um, we were hoping to um, just find some solutions, like can we get some retired teachers that maybe want to come in and support and keep the libraries open? Um, right now, we don't have any additional staff, um, but we are. We want to continue to just investigate that. Um, but Melena and Josh, who's the other elementary librarian, uh, worked on per the collecting data regarding how many times people are out and that sort of thing, um, which happens, you know, when people are sick. Um, so that's really a high-level overview of the things that we've done in the area of strategic actions for collaborative leadership. Um, it's really just about working together, and uh, our focus was to create some of those meeting structures so that the collaboration um, could be done to provide continuous supports for students. I'll keep going, um, but we can always come back and discuss any part of it. Um, so 
As we shared previously in um, August, there are purchasing guidelines for any common school fund purchases. Um, I know this is an area where some people, we have to remind people of those guidelines, but I just wanted to refresh you, your minds of that, that there is always those guidelines. Um, for example, you would think that a barcode for a book could be purchased with common school funds. Um, but that's not something that can be purchased with common school funds. So then we have to budget for that in teaching and learning. So there's all these different nuances of how we can and can't spend common school funds um, that we do follow. And we've taken into consideration as every year the team has when it comes to the budget and resources. The barcode was just an example. And you're referring to the label? Yeah, okay. so in order to be checked out, it's one of those silly things. You would think it's for the library, but it's not something that can be purchased. And that's just a really good example that you can't buy shelving, but you also can't buy barcodes. So we have to just factor that in a different way. Um, so in the, we had the budget and resources as a priority area for our group, um, partially because, you know, when we look back, the common school funding aid has really doubled since, you know, in the last maybe seven years, I think it was 2017, the amount that we receive in aid has really doubled. And so we really have a significant amount of funds coming in to support the library program. One thing we did this year and um, I'm really proud of, I think it's joining um, heads together with library and technology. Um, and that is that we worked on our device replacement plan. So it's, um, so rather than individual school librarians deciding what technology is purchased in their library individually, we've made a device replacement plan so that we um, replaced all the library aid iPads at the same time. So that role has a the same device and it's replaced. Um, so we've started to develop and will continue to develop this replacement plan um, to help prioritize where our money is going as it relates to some of the technology. So rather than having an individual site-based, we're doing a more systemic look and then ensuring that each of the libraries are a bit more consistent. Um, so this year, as you can see, in the beginning of the year, we were in progress for um, developing and integrating that second equipment group as far as the circulation and lookup stations. Um, we have since then completed that. Um, we've incorporated um, the technology uh, re into the replacement cycles. We now have done a refresh for the high schools. That's what we're just finalizing right now. Um, our south, north, and west, um, as far as their technology equipment, it was very, it was very site specific to what was available. And so as a group, they've worked together to really refresh all the technology in their libraries um, and working with the technology department around that as well. Um, so that is really in the complete stage, um, but something that we will continue in next year's uh, uh, plan. The next area that we focused on was the review process for our digital subscriptions. Um, and databases. Um, right now we are spending a bit more time looking at one of our bigger expenses which is discovery education. Um, Melaine and the team are collecting uh, feedback from teachers regarding the use of that and again always just wanting to figure out is this the best way to use these resources and are teachers using them, are we using them in the libraries um, and getting the best bang for our buck out of those. That is still in progress. Closer to the end of the year, the library media specialist will collect um, usage data on all the different databases, um, but Discover, Discovery Education is one of the ones that we've talked about, we talked about last year and is, we'll have a bigger focus of investigation now uh, for right now. Um, one of the other things we did in budget is uh, recognize that uh, we have all of our secondary schools are dual language and offer many opportunities for kids. What we found was that at our secondary schools, we had limited text in the library that were in Spanish. And many students obviously coming in, taking advantage of dual language program. Um, and so we wanted to beef up, beef up our collection around having texts that were in Spanish in the libraries. Um, eventually when we wanna 
do this around the whole district, but for this year we started with middle school. Um, Josh Regath is one of our library media specialists. We've been fortunate enough that he was a dual language teacher. So really he has taken the point on the Spanish text, um, ensuring that this year our middle schools have really gained um, more resources when it comes to um, Spanish, uh, books in Spanish. He does a great job of digging through the resources as well. Um, that was something I think Melena would say our team was lacking a bit um, prior to Josh coming, so that's helped to you know, enhance our team dynamics. Um, in anticipation of this for next year, uh, we would dedicate specific amount of funds to the high school um, in that same way that we did library, and then just continue to rotate that to ensure we have um, really good Spanish uh, text or any other languages that we're going to develop a little bit more in the libraries. Um, with the budget and resources, we wanted to bring forward just an overview of uh, the spending uh, with our allocation for this year. Um, we worked with the business office um, very much um, throughout the year to develop um, a process to ensure if something was purchased for the whole system and district-wide, that that was really coming from that district-wide funding. But then also, as we prioritize the purchase of Spanish text for the middle school library, we wanted that to come from a district-wide middle school uh, level account. Um, so we did some adjustment with some of our counts, our accounts that we're just using on the back end just to help us organize our work. Um, but here's how the breakdown looks for all of our um, 23-24 school year uh, allocation for common school funds, which does include the carryover from last year. Um, so quite a bit there with um, a million. Um, after we do all the expenses as far as elementary level, middle school level, and high school level, and district wide, those those purchases come off the top. So that's like the technology that we spoke to, the Spanish text, anything in this district plan. Um, and the subscriptions, and then it breaks down to about half of the funds are then divided among all the sites, and that's where the library media specialists are ensuring that we have uh, books, digital books. Um, they are turning in uh, their purchasing requests, um, and they often narrow it down to uh, this is a reorder of a text that it's just damaged and needs to be replaced to this is series of books that we need to get to these are new um, text. Um, so that's how the budget breaks down um, as far as off the top um, spending and then also per school that amount is divided, um, that individual site amount is divided. Um, I wanted to take a moment and talk about the purchasing process. Um, that was something we've been working on. We've been doing quarterly updates. Um, and I would say I think I'm getting a little bit better. <laughs> um, but it is, it's very, it is time consuming. Um, but what happens is I have a picture here of Skyward and Amazon Prime. And then so often in the purchasing process, we're going into Skyward and approving it. Um, but I th think how things are doing, there's multiple touch points along the way um, between the library media specialists, um, then it gets submitted, I look at them, um, and then I approve them. So I, I look at them, and then sometimes they're not in Skyward, then I have to go in Skyward and look at them and approve them. Sometimes things are purchased on Amazon and so then I approve them, then they go into Skyward. So sometimes just with our pro purchase process right now, we're touching things multiple times. Um, so we're still looking to find some efficiencies. I know I myself am getting a little bit better of, oh yeah, I approved that in, um, in Amazon and now it's just a carryover. So it's just making those connections. Um, but that has been an adjustment we've been doing about quarterly ordering. Um, I think the library media specialists would say that the most impact they've had is that that on the moment purchase has been challenging for them if it doesn't fall into a quarterly ordering time. Um, but we've had conversations around, you know, if if it's regarding <laughs> curriculum or accommodations for a student, let's we're not going to wait till quarter quarterly ordering. Let's you know get that now. 
Um, so we've just kind of spent some time at our department meetings talking through some of those situations. All right. Jen. Just a, a question or clarification. Mm -hmm. What's an example of something that would be time sensitive that's curriculum related? Yeah. X for units. <laughs> so yeah, well, I, we, had an ex we had an example at the elementary level. Erica uh, asked us to find some updated resources for science curriculum. Uh, we found a resource, but we didn't have it in every school. And so, um, you know, it was really hard to get that in time for when, you know, it kind of, we had a couple of weeks, but it just didn't happen fast enough. So we kind of missed the boat on that one. Um, that's not happened a lot, but it happened. We had a student who was traveling, I think over spring break request. You know how they have those travel guides? I, I guess South has some, some travel guides, like when you visit another country. And the student asked, you know, you don't have one about wherever he was going. And it just took, you know, he was gone by the time um, we were able to get that in place. So, you know, having to jump through a couple of other hoops sometimes affects our ability to turn on a dime, so to speak, and, and really get something that hasn't been planned for, I guess. I mean, we all know that in every situation there's, there's always stuff that hits you by surprise. And mostly it's just people saying, oh, it would be nice if we could do this too. So that's probably the biggest, um, and they've been kind of one-offs, you know. Um, we're trying very hard to anticipate as much as we can, and the meetings that we're going to talk about later with the, with the other departments are really helping with that because it's allowing us to know more in advance what will be needed in the future. So it sounds like there may be new resources that might be a complement to an already established curriculum, mm -hmm. or there may be new curriculum that we're just implementing and we say, hey, this would be a great thing to add. Yes. And it, that would be called out somewhere in the lesson plan or in the curriculum as well? If, mm -hmm. Or how do we address that if there's, as new materials come on board over time and that becomes established as part of the curriculum, where does that get memorialized? Um, well, right now with new curriculum, we're already doing that with the elementary literacy. So rather than waiting till it's bought and then saying, hey, library media specialist, do you want to collaborate? We already started collaborating now on, hey, what are some books that come with it? What are some read-alouds? How do we integrate some of those read-alouds possibly when Milena's at that school? Like, could she do the read-aloud for the unit two at every second grade. I don't know. I'm just making that up. Um, but we're starting those collaborative conversations right away now rather than reactive where some of our subject matter as teachers are planning, they get ideas and then they go to the librarians and they're like, oh yeah, that'd be awesome. But then we just have to organize it. So we are doing a better job of proactively like collaborating and getting more resources together. So... I can speak to that a little bit. Josh and I are going through the same training schedule for the benchmark implementation at the elementary level. We've gone to some of those meetings where we're experiencing the training as they have. And in our conversations with Emily, um, she's given us a heads up of some things that would be really helpful from us. And just today, Josh and I were meeting to deal with some of that and looking at things that we need to purchase in order to accomplish what she'd like us to accomplish. And what's really interesting is, is we're digging into that benchmark work kind of from our perspective. We're, we already have a list of questions to come back with to Emily and say, you know, what if we did this, we think this book in the, in that's listed here is a little old. What if we updated it? You know, that's kind of the conversations that are, are happening right now because of that, so. Oh, thank you. So here pictured are a few of like the budget and resources, how we've spent the money. Um, so the lookup stations, just like when you go to a bookstore yourself, there's lookup stations. So we ensure that we have those in each of our schools. I think the ones up here 
are at west because it's got the blue writing. Um, and then in the middle, the picture is of recording studios. Um, this is currently at west, but as we did the high school refresh, we're working to have these similar stations for recording um, at north and south. Um, it just allows our teachers to collaborate a little bit more with the resources in the library, but also with each other across the system when they have the same resources. Um, so um, that's what it's pictured like at West. And then um, there's another picture of West that um, just their computer set up. Um, each of the other schools are working towards updating their technology. Some of them, South and North, have a lab that they'll continue to have. Um, where West doesn't, but it's, it's used differently at different schools. So we're just working to update that and have similar experiences for all of our students at the high school level. So the rest of the um, library plan um, focuses on the area of curriculum and instruction. And this is where I, many of your detailed questions, I'll look at Melaine and say, okay, give me some detail um, and help me out. But this is where we took the same format again. We have the area of curriculum instruction, talked about what we're doing at each level. Um, and then throughout the year, we've been working on it. And you'll notice that some things were paused, some things were in progress, some things are complete. Um, I broke down the whole sheet into three slides. Um, so this very first part will just be those two rows at the very top that's focused on scope and sequence um, and working with instructional technology coordinators. Um, so Melina's going to talk a little bit more specifics for these. So those first two slides are really K-12 um, focus. So it's kind of the whole the whole shebang focus. So one of the things that was frustrating to us is over time, there had been so many changes, especially at the district level of who was in charge of curriculum, that our ties that we had to those curriculum folks weren't as clear. And so we weren't, we would get information from teachers, but we weren't seeing the big picture. And so we, um, one of the strategic actions we made is let's just make sure that we have the scope and sequence for at least the um, English language arts curriculum. And so that was given to us right away, so that's done. That was an easy one. Um, then the other thing that had sort of uh, gotten away from us is several years ago, I think it's close to 10 now, we had developed a digital citizenship uh, lessons for our students, which is really important, right, about the safety and legality of using technology. Um, but like I said, it had been some time since it had been revisited, links were dead, information was out of date. And so in this plan, we decided to update those lessons. That was something we actually worked on last spring, and it was implemented this fall. Um, we worked with the um, the technology coordinators to help with some of those lessons that were more uh, device specific because that's more their area. Um, but those lessons are completed and now being implemented in the schools and have been since September. So those are the two kind of K-12 um, things that we were working on. So if we look then at the next slide, this is a focus on secondary. And so typically, and this was true years ago when I worked at West High School, um, when new texts were purchased by curriculum instruction, especially um, when you think about like novels that were read in the English classes and that, we also purchased extra copies of them in the library because I came without my book today, or, or I lost a book, or a book is damaged, or whatever. So we always tried to support that, as well as we would purchase audio uh, versions of books that especially can be helpful for students with different abilities um, to support that learning. So um, we were looking at, we just wanted to make sure that we were up to date in what we had um, in the library that was supporting the text that were being used in the curriculum. And so that has, it was paused initially because there was a time when there was a change in the leadership at the secondary level in the English language arts department. So we just had to wait for all that to shake out and someone come on board. And at, at this point now those conversations are happening and those orders have gone in. 
We've also worked through some of the funding, um, I think with the change in leadership too, just um, clarifying what fundings, you know, resources were put aside for that or not, um, whether it be common school funds or others. Um, so we've worked through that as well and been able to move forward with that. Uh, the, the next thing um, was to, to reestablish regular communication with the literacy team. So again, we would be prepared, not taken by surprise, if something new was coming on. And so that really helped, helps us be, have things at the ready for when new things are coming on board or a change has been made or, or something like that. Um, so again, paused initially, but now it's in, um, in its completion. And then um, this is also something that has been done um, as long as I've been a librarian, especially at the secondary level, that the library media specialists create uh, research guides that include digital and print resources for whatever it is they're studying. Um, usually, or some, sometimes those are created when the teacher comes to us and says, gee, I'm gonna do this project on this, what do you have? And so that's one way we can get that done, but obviously it's more efficient when we're working, when we're ahead of that game and they're not coming to us the day before they start the research process, which is typically, you know, where teachers are. We're gonna see that ahead in, in the curriculum because we have these connections and we can, first of all, get those materials that we need and start to organize them in a way that we can hand them off to kids in a Google Doc or whatever, something they can click on to get to the database, books, a list of titles of books that would be helpful, and where to find those. So those are all in place, and I feel like they're stronger because of our ties at the district level as well as our ties with teachers. When we were just teacher uh, dependent, we didn't always know even that they were doing research. Um, especially new teachers, don't always realize the value of working with a librarian on projects like that. We've also been able to talk at, in those collaborative sessions about who's doing what. There's no reason a library media specialist is working with this English language arts teacher for ninth grade at one school and whatever they're working on across town, another group is working on the same thing. So how do we work on it together and collaborate and just kind of conquer and divide so we have more resources for different subjects? And so the next slide is talking about uh, our goals at the elementary level. And so even at the elementary level, we use electronic databases as well as print books when um, they're working on projects in their classroom. And we wanted to make sure that teachers were into, you know, aware of the resources that were available. Most teachers, especially elementary teachers, know to look for books, but sometimes they may or may not realize that we have, we have uh, resources that really are for primary age students um, that they may not be aware of. There's just so much that's there. Um, we're trying to do that. So one of the things we did is focused on a few of the resources, in this case, Pebble Go, which is one of those resources that initially is designed for um, K2 students. Um, reads to them, simpler text, lots of pictures, things like that. And then even our initial, our Britannica Encyclopedia is another one that has really great features for younger students um, with read alouds and, and such. So these are things that we made sure that teachers knew how to use. Teachers were pretty good about knowing how to use Pebble Go. We've had it for a really long time. And so they were available, or they were, um, understanding that that was available to them. And it's even written in some of their curriculum where teachers were helping write the curriculum. Um, and so we've been making them aware of other things, including that Britannica Encyclopedia and also other things, but we focused on those. So um, we're talking about other credible resources for them using using them in their elementary career. And I would just add that those specific resources mentioned in our strategic actions for the elementary level, um, those were based on usage data from previous year and feedback from teachers. And then working with the um, literacy coordinator and the library media specialist that we weren't seeing the usage of these resources to a high level and wanted 
and felt that they were valuable and it could integrate very well. And so that's where they became part of our strategic actions for this year. So the next uh, section talks about um, having the library media specialist have a session during the teacher new teacher trainings that they have to attend after school. Um, initially, we had planned to offer that, um, but it was paused because there just was no room in their training schedule. So a, tr a real frustration for us um, is prior to COVID, um, we used to participate in staff development and be able to talk about resources that were available specifically to primary students. There was just a different structure for staff development. But we've been taking on so much new curriculum that most of our PD has been really focused on that curriculum, as it should be, right, because we want it implemented with integrity. And so what we were finding is our, our teachers weren't as familiar with some of these additional resources that were available to them through the library. And so even though we weren't able to get and be part of the new teacher training program, we're looking at other ways to do that. One of the things that I think we may be able to do, we're hoping this summer during some of the PD will pick up on some of that again. And I've also talked to um, some folks in the curriculum office about creating a TDP class, which is one of the courses that teachers, new teachers have to take. They have so many years to take nine credits at, as a new teacher in the district. So if we have a course, that can be one of the things they can choose to be more aware of the resources that are available to them. And not just for any, it's for any teacher, new or veteran right. teachers. I would just clarify the, the work of this training team is around, it was around all professional de development and like a three-year plan for each group because of some of the changes in leadership we had a we had to pause some of that and that's just part of it not just specific only to uh, new teachers or library media specialists um, the other uh, one bit of technology so in the previous pictures you saw some of the technology being inter uh, integrated at the high school or updated at the high school the one thing that we did up Date for students at the elementary level were uh, a way for students to be better um, presenters of information, whether it be through a video or through a slideshow or through a podcast. Um, the simple way to do that is with a microphone. Um, one of the pictures in, in the previous slides showed a podcast recording station. Now, unfortunately, because our libraries aren't staffed full time, it was hard to make that a station because it wouldn't always be accessible to kids. So what we decided to do is make it portable. And so we purchased microphones that could be checked out and utilized for whenever they're doing their projects in their classroom. Um, I've already provided some teaching with teachers who were the first ones to come and grab some of those to make sure they understood how that all worked and everything. So um, that was kind of one of our technology um, updates that we wanted to provide to kids to be able to to prepare them for what was gonna, they were gonna see in middle school and high school. And that also fits spe specifically with certain units in the ELA curriculum at the elementary level, just making those connections to, we're not just jumping to podcasts just to do them. That's just an option that kids may have when it comes to producing you know, their work or their learning. So. Um, on the last slide um, here, we are always looking forward. Um, we've, like I said, we started to draft and develop um, more specific things for our next, our plan for next year. But again, this would be always be a three-year rolling plan. Um, in the area of collaborative leadership, we've talked about expanding our work to other departments with social studies um, and or science. Um, in the area of budget, uh, researching more in depth, like I had talked about the discovery education. And then also in the area of budgeting and prioritizing those uh, Spanish texts or texts in Spanish for our high schools um, and looking at those. Uh, we want to also look at our other uh, facilities as far as technology and consider if there's a need for technology replacement like there was at the high school level. And then in the area of curriculum instruction, the team has already started to investigate some things. Um, one of the things that they're looking at right now is taking what we have for social studies at the elementary level and possibly middle school, um, but, or just elementary. Keep talking. 
Um, the, I'm not sure. So the idea, though, is to enhance some of our social studies and science curriculum oh, with the VR goggles. Oh, no, that's just middle school. Okay. So that is on our potential things for curriculum instruction steps and in how to collaborate with library media specialists. Um, the group had tons of ideas of how to in integrate and really get kids around the world just from still being in our in Waukesha. Um, so those are just some of the ideas, but we're open for discussion, questions. Um, Melina can probably give you more details to some of your detailed questions, but I can give you high-level overview questions as far as the plan and next steps. Um, but we're just happy to bring it here and just update you on the work that's been done. Mrs. Kozlowski. Thank you. You know, so the first time that we walked through this plan last year, I think we were all overwhelmed. Um, but this is, this is a lot of really great work. And I, I'm looking at the collaboration and a lot of the pieces that we saw together come together and how it links between the curriculum and the teachers and the students. I, it's really, it, it's, it's awesome to, to watch and, and just to see your expressions, which are very different than when we were here for a year ago. And I, and I mean that wholeheartedly in a very positive way because it's, it's exciting to see some of these connections and not only just within each individual school but to how it's encompassing across the district to go online with the curriculum and hearing about different ways that we have to go so I it's just really rewarding to see this um, I do have a question regarding the common school funding so I have a couple questions how big is the balance that we have out there to spend Left. yes I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think, well, I'm going to let you talk to it because we've worked really hard to spend down what has been given to us for each individual school. I'm not certain about these, some of these things have been taken off the top, so we don't necessarily have access to see that. And I don't need an answer, Jen, right now, but I think it would be a good follow-up is just to understand that. And then the other piece that I get con continuously challenged on is the limitations on what we can and cannot spend it on. If I can just get a reminder of what that bucket looks like, mm -hmm. that would be helpful. Yeah, we can pull that from uh, slide two. Mm -hmm. um, takes you right to, yeah, we can pull that right from here. Okay. I don't know if I saw the specifics. I just knew, heard some um, of the pieces. There's a link on there Purchasing that it's guide, kind of five. the... Sorry. Five. Yeah. Okay. It's a guide that we use all the time that help us decide can we can we spend it or can it can we not, um, and some of it is like the idea of can we buy shelves? No, we can't buy shelves. We can buy books. Um, the barcode thing, we can buy barcodes if they're attached to the books when we buy them. <laughs> you know, if the company does that, but we can't just buy barcodes not attached to anything. It's so bizarre. It's really weird rules around that, and I don't know. I can't speak to how that was all developed. Um, I would say the other thing I think that varies district to district is that. Spending is based on, so whenever we go and ask the DPI, can we buy this? Because they're the ones who kind of okay. maintain the rules. I don't think they set them, because most of it is set by the state statutes. But um, we'll say, can we buy this? And they'll, they'll turn right around and say, what's in your library plan? And so whenever we want to do that, we have to attach it to the library plan, which means it has to be attached not just, it doesn't mean it's housed in the library, it means it's run by the library. So that means that we're the ones who are, are presenting the learning of whatever's attached, whatever we're buying, which is really hard um, with the staffing levels we're at. So like the example I gave with the podcasting, you know, we can't set it up in the libraries because we wouldn't have access to it all the time. So we had to think of a way to deal with that. There are librarians across the state who are doing makerspace um, lessons and activities. We can't do that because we're not staffed to a level that we are able to do that. So that's, that's one of our limitations that we have. It's very staff dependent. Um, that's when they talk about what are you teaching in your library courses or, you know, in your libraries. That's 
that's one of the things that limits us to what we can purchase. Um, and like I said, you will see places around us that are doing those things because they've staffed for it. They've staffed differently. I'll get the overall how much we spent, but as far as all the things off the top, we're making pretty good progress, and we've talked about our getting our last orders in sooner rather than later, so we're probably already at 70% um, total spent already, um, but I'll get a specific number for you and update you guys. No, that's good, and I, it, they, so I just two last things. Um, I'm encouraged about the dual language and getting in additional text for that. So I think that's something just to make sure that we're talking through and speaking on that because of the growing population on that. Um, and then my last comment is back to uh, the same comment that I had a year ago, which is the IT liaison for like Go Pebble, all of those to making sure that the content that the students are able to access is age appropriate. If we're talking K2, then it needs to be there. And I think that was just some of the complaints that we've had. Now, I haven't heard anything, I haven't talked about it, but that was a follow-up that we did address last time is making sure that what we're having our elementary students see that they can't somehow end up someplace else. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah, that, I mean, that's part of the process that we go through whenever we're on onboarding new things or even in some of our stuff that we've had for a long, like brain pop we've had for more than 10 years, um, they've made changes so that we have more control of what we can uh, show to different students. Um, part of that was just implemented when we started, when we put everything in ClassLink. We had a better, we were better able to control what kids could see in those, um, those resources. Good. So those resources are adapting to the, that need as well. And we're working with the companies to, um, to let them know what our needs are and then to implement it as we need to. We had to make some changes to some of them of how we authenticated and got into those resources so we could do that and the tech department was great at helping us do that. Good. Well, this is a great update, thank you. Mr. Zenobia. Thank you. Uh, again, great, great presentation. I, I think from what I'm hearing is a lot of the planning that's gone into this is even creating some efficiencies across all the schools and how we've done things in the past, which, which is excellent. Um, with, with all the new curriculum that's come, come in, it sounds like you're playing somewhat of a catch up game to support all that. And, um, I think you spoke to that a little bit with the amount of resources you have, uh, but how how is that going, I guess, for the year, but is there like a, a catch-up point you're kind of looking toward, an end goal, or are you just going to be kind of catching up with that as long as it's, it's there? Well, I, like I said, you know, I've been doing this job here for 20 years now, and I've, I've seen it go both ways. At one point, we had lost a connection with the district. I think at one point we were, we were better connected. Um, for whatever reason, it probably having to do with lots of staffing turnover, um, we kind of lost those connections. Now we're making it, what's great with this library plan is we can make it a priority. So it's back to being a priority. So like I said, Josh and I are, are, are um, participating in the training that onboarding of that curriculum. And as, as former classroom teachers ourselves, we're looking at that from two angles. We're looking at it, if I were a classroom teacher, what would I want? And as a librarian, I'm looking at it and say, yep, I would want that, and how can I get that to them? So being included in the implementation is probably the best way that we can stay ahead of it. So you know, just remembering that our staff has to be part of that process and be aware of, of that. And what's really great is like our relationship with Emily at the elementary level. Um, I can't speak to the secondary because I only work at the elementary, but I can speak that in our relationship, what Emily was able to do is say, you know, we think this would be a great way for you to help us because we're not going to be able to get to all this. But if you could do some of these read alouds, that would be really helpful. So she's looking at it with a new partner in mind, not just the teacher who's in front of the kids all the time, but also for this 
uh, opportunity that the kids have once a week to go visit the library and, and have the same or similar supporting information be offered to them in that area as well. So we just, like I said, the more we're together, like Ms. Kozlowski said, that really helps us be more efficient. You had also mentioned something about just not being sometimes timely enough to get those few resources, and that's just the overarching approval process of just double-checking everything. Is that kind of what's question mark there? Yeah, and moving to quarterly ordering. So in the past, um, librarians, I mean, there's five of them. So at any point, a uh, order could have come in at any time on Amazon and Skyward, you know, all these different areas. Um, and then if you approved it on Amazon, you still had to go and approve it two days later on Skyward. And so um, moving it to quarterly has given, tightened them up as far as that just in time need. Um, I'm hoping that as I move over to just teaching and learning that will be a little bit more flexible, but I think having timelines for each ordering period does helps me to better serve them. Sure. Um, so part of it is, it's just the long process. Yeah. And I try and do it quick, and I know um, everyone's doing their really best job, but. Yeah, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for the update. Will we see an annual update then in August, or is this? We could do it a variety of ways. Part from here, what we are going to do is um, obviously work on defining next year, you know, continue that rolling of the three-year plan. We could plan to come fall and spring each year, um, or if you prefer, we do an annual one just at the end of the year. Um, I liked how we did it this year with a, a fall and a spring um, it really helps us to say, like, here are the things that we're working on, mm -hmm. um, but we're open to ideas. But I would think I would probably err on the fall and spring, and then we can discuss and change as needed. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you, and thank you, Melena, for all your work and being here. All right. We're jumping all the way to our... Other teaching and learning business, we have four discussion items coming up. We're going to start with our embedded agriculture update. Was there any interest in looking at the order of things? I noticed we have, well, Laura's probably just going to stay, come back and forth. <laughs> okay, that's fine. That's fine. She's here for three quarters of it. So. Fine. Um. We have a great team um, tonight to tell you a little bit more about the work that we've been doing in embedded agriculture. Uh, many of you uh, may have went to an activity where we were talking about how great this lunch is. And um, I think it was then where some of us looked at each other and said, we should celebrate this at Teaching and Learning because it's one of the great things that is going on in our system. Um, and so we have a group here that's going to give you a few more details about what this all incorporates um, and just what it looks like at the school uh, level beyond just there's lettuce and salad for people to eat. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having us tonight. Um, I'm Molly Havenshield, the Career and Technical Education Coordinator. And I'm Erica Yoss, the Science and Environmental Ed Coordinator. So we'll give you a little bit of an overview of how this um, partnership came to be and the great mix that it's become. Uh, so we wanted to just start with, uh, it, it kind of happened on accident to be quite honest, um, as all good things do. It started with a brief conversation between Erica and myself. Um, Erica's work with environmental education is something that is amazing and other counties and schools look to us as as a leader in that area. Um, and with her work with the greenhouse and her team's garden, they had an abundance of produce left. And she said, Molly, how would your students in culinary feel about cooking with that? And I was like, absolutely. So it started with really sharing that, that wealth of resources. Um, but we wanted to make sure it was more than just us using those fresh ingredients. So we talked as a team about how we could maybe bridge some curricular connections between science, between agriculture, which is really missing in Waukesha County, and the culinary practices. Um, so we, that's really where the, the foundation was. Um, we discussed 
how to bring it into a classroom and teach from a farm to plate type mentality and really using those resources uh, so that they came to the best use possible within our system. Uh, we started a pilot at West High School thanks to a WEF grant. Um, they donated a bit of money to get us going and originally we had planned to do outdoor garden beds and then we realized in Wisconsin um, outdoor growing beds and school seasons don't necessarily jive. So we actually went to WEF and said, how about us tweaking the grant? And they were gracious enough to let us do that and, and talk about indoor growing systems. So with that pilot class, we had the students research what kinds of indoor growing systems exist, what would they use based on the space and the time period? And they came up with a hydroponic unit. And we purchased the lettuce grow system. So if you get a chance to walk down by room 210, there is one in there right now that we're just housing temporarily. Um, and that was what we started with. And the students helped design what we were growing, why we were growing it, and then we partnered with Erica's environmental ed team, the master gardeners, to develop some mini lessons around sustainable gardening practices, why we grow what we grow in Wisconsin, when we grow it in Wisconsin, and how to use it right in the cooking that you do and what are the benefits to it, nutritionally, taste, and cost. So this is just a, a brief 13-day difference in what they grew. Uh, we, we are primarily focused on leafy greens and herbs uh, because those are easier to grow and not kill. Um, and the students were really excited about it. They came in every day and were astounded by the progress. They were checking on their plant babies and they were just making sure they were nurturing them and, and doing everything that was needed to make sure that they were growing successfully. And then they got to taste the rewards. So with the success of that pilot, we knew that we had to figure out what we really wanted to do moving forward. It was great, we wanted to grow it, but we had to kind of figure out what was our mission, what was our purpose. So as a leadership team, we connected and created our mission statement um, of what we believe in and what we want to focus on with our students. It's not just about um, that embedded agriculture, it's about the students understanding where their food comes from, um, how long it does take to grow. You can't just plan your menu tomorrow if you have to plant your seeds a month ago. So they can have an understanding that they can take somewhere else outside of the school, that they can do it in their personal life, in the career, and just kind of giving them that, that understanding. Uh, we created our goals for our partnership. Um, these were our four main areas that we wanted to focus on and that we were going to collect our data around. So the student and staff education was the number one. Um, not only were we going to be helping students understand where their food came from, but we wanted to support our staff um, in understanding how the systems worked and how they could utilize them. Many of them are gardening experts themselves, but they hadn't done hydroponics and we wanted to provide support there. Um, goal around sustainable gardening. Um, how can you do this yourself? How can we reduce our, um, our input and get the most output from it? That idea of farm to table cooking and the community connections. We wanted to make sure that we weren't just doing this here, we were working with all of the other community resources that we have in Waukesha area. So as we continued to grow the idea, um, we moved into having the Fork Farms units, which are the really big ones that look kind of like a stand-up tanning bed, if you've seen them. Um, through Fork Farms, and again, through some amazing grant funding, we were able to purchase um, a unit for every high school in their family consumer science um, classrooms. We are working on having local tours so that teachers and students can see how these things are grown in other places, not just in the hydroponic unit. We focused a lot of our time on the back end on that strategic planning, um, all of the spreadsheets that we've created and making sure that we're growing things in the way that isn't overwhelming and is a sustainable process. We really wanted to set up a lot of um, curriculum for the teachers to use. We have a mentoring program with the master gardeners through the Environmental Ed Center um, and then a co-teaching partnership with them. And, and then finally, really just sharing beyond our local community, how can we share what we're doing and have others share you know, reciprocally with us what they are doing in their farms. Uh, so part of that was really empowering our teachers. You know, we wanted to make sure that we weren't asking them to do this just to do it. They wanted, we wanted to make sure they were bought into the idea. So before we even said, hey, we're gonna give you this unit to put in your classroom, we got a grant for it, we really wanted to make sure they were on board. And, and they all wholeheartedly were. So we put some processes and procedures into place and we did some training with them. So two of the pictures are from some summer work. 
we did a, at the Summer Institute launch, we actually gave the high school teachers time along with Generac to build out the units so they didn't have to do that in their free time. It, because the engineers were there, it really didn't take as long as we anticipated, which was great. They had a lot of time to learn about the Fork Farms unit itself. There's lots of resources that we gave them and walked them through to make sure that they felt prepared in case anything happened. Uh, the master gardeners, again, were there working with our teachers to make them make sure they felt comfortable with just the hydroponic piece. We also did a team building activity actually at the EB Shirts um, garden where the teachers got to learn about the gardening practices there. They got to do a chopped challenge where they had to use fresh ingredients to create a pizza and work in teams, so that was really fun. And then another day that we did was a preservation workshop. And this also came from the fact that we just had a wealth of ingredients left over and we didn't want it to go to waste. So how can we make them um, sustainable moving forward? So we brought in some experts around dehydration, uh, vacuum sealing, stewing, making sauce bases, and the teachers all worked with the environmental ed staff to do that. It was a fun day. Um, they made refrigerator pickles. I'm trying to think what else. But the point of that was for them to see the things that they could then do in their classroom with their students with the things that they have excess of. So basil takes off. We have a ton. Now what do we do with it? We really uh, came through with a fine tooth comb on what the teachers and students really needed. We created a one pager, it's a one and a half pager, but what do they absolutely need? And there's a one stop shop for them and I think they've all really been really appreciative of that work. And then that preservation workshop, one of our goals that we're still growing is to create a pantry EE, -E -E, environmental ed, uh, where the teachers can basically create their own community garden sharing program where if I have an abundance of something, I have excess of something, it goes onto a spreadsheet and then another teacher can look at it and say, oh, perfect, I need some extra basil this month, I can pull it from there. And we've already seen a pretty heavy use in that and it comes from community partners as well. Um, Erica mentioned some data that we were collecting. So this is just two questions on the student survey that we gave out at the beginning of the year showing the interest in eating fresh vegetables that they maybe have not eaten before. Shockingly enough, students don't want to eat something unless they have to, right? And maybe eating uh, fresh vegetables, especially things that they've never tried before, might be something a little scary. So we're hoping to see a change in that. And then testing their thought processes about our indoor grown for, you know, fruits, vegetables, produce, whatever it is, as healthy as those things grown outdoors. So we're hoping to see a shift in that mentality based on the lessons that we provided for the students. We also surveyed the teachers about their belief on hydroponics. Initially, they all felt, yeah, I think it's a cost-effective manner, but they didn't really know what that would look like, and I don't want to spoil what's coming down the pipes. Uh, and then have they talked about it? And we kind of anticipated the fact that most, student, most of the teachers have not talked about sustainable agriculture. Agriculture is not one of our career pathways that we really do anything with in Waukesha County, so I'm not shocked about that. So we're again hoping to see that data shift. So beyond just the, the quantitative data, we're, we're collecting a lot of qualitative data um, from the teachers and from the students and from our community partners. These are just a few of the really great things that we have noticed. Um, closing opportunity gaps, not only curricularly, um, but also for students who might not have ever had access to growing their own food. So we can show them how you can do it no matter where you're located. You don't need to have a lot of green space to be able to do that. Um, we have increased access to materials. We had a middle school teacher who was able to make salsa with a cilantro for the first time ever in her career because they didn't have the money for it in their budget before, and that's allowed them to have much more reduced costs for, of cilantro, which is fantastic. Um, student ownership has been my favorite part to mm -hmm. see. The students have taken on this as their own. They call them their plant babies. They, like, they oh love God. it. Um, we are leading into summer school um, with the, the gardening cl cooking class. They're also doing hydroponics alongside of it. So they can, the students can see where these foods can come from. Obviously, there have been some learning <laughs> moments. Um, you can see um, on the, one of the pictures, Molly and I, we didn't know that we'd be plumbers, but we, we learned a lot about how to work with water and power sources, and you can't plug two things in in the same breaker, so we had to figure that out. Um, love, thankfully, we have an amazing buildings and grounds team who has put up with all of the questions that we have, and they support us, and they help us through all of this. Um, but I think the biggest one has been that scalability. We, we want to grow, but we want to grow at 
a pace that won't cause us to kind of get overwhelmed. Uh, and the most important part is the, in the classroom. What are students doing? Um, they have access to ingredients, like I said, that they might not have had before, or they've had the dried version. So, you know, they've always been using oregano, but now they have the fresh version. They've always had basil, but now they have the fresh version. And now they have this concept of farm-to-table planning. Um, the picture at the top you can see are students at North. They had to start um, about a month and a half out. They had to decide what ingredients they were going to grow for their dish, create their menu, so that later on they could harvest it and cook it. And we were lucky enough, we actually got to come in and taste all their food, so that's the best part of this job, is we get to eat a lot of what these kids make. Um, and those classes are fantastic. They, they make a lot of amazing food. So they are really learning like how long this process takes, and you can't just like on a whim necessarily come up with this, but where can we do this? Um, and that's elevated curricular outcomes. Students are creating dishes that they might not have created. Um, when we were at North, a lot of the students actually are bringing in some of the things from their own home culture and those ingredients and talking about how they could grow those and how those, those herbs and spices can actually meld with what we're having, which has been a conversation that wasn't always happening before because these were just the recipes that they were given and they created them. So it's really kind of allowed the students to take that ownership. And this is just a few quotes, I obviously won't read them, of just what some of the students have been saying. Um, they really were shocked by how quick the things grow. They have had a lot of fun and they think the best part is like they're taking these things home with them too. So if there's an abundance of cilantro basil, they, the students take it home with them and they can cook and show their families what they've been growing. Um, I mean, I think one of this is that they took cilantro home and made guacamole with their parents, which is fantastic. Um, and the teacher has just really, the teachers have been nothing but complimentary about the whole process. And honestly, they are the ones who have had to do all the really hard work. So we really appreciate that not only have they done this, but they're enjoying it and they want more. I mean, I, th I think if we asked any of them, they would say, yes, give me more of the units. We want more. We want to keep doing it because they've seen so much benefit from it. Beyond the curricular connections, we started to bridge out into community connections. So these are just a few pictures. Um, some of you were, well, all of you were invited to the, the luncheon where we kind of debuted this partnership at Waukesha South where the students grew every, well, not everything, but a lot of the ingredients and cooked for us. Um, in addition, we had area partners. Gwendon Hill Farms has been a great partner for us where we can reach out to them and they supplied ingredients for us either through a donation or, or just selling it to us at, at a lower cost that the students use to create those meals. Um, the cookies in the top corner, um, those flowers we actually grew here in our hydroponic unit um, down the hall. And then um, we've partnered, we're starting to partner with other uh, area vendors. The Farmer's Market, Spring City Garden Club has always been a partner of Erica's, so now they're starting to uh, find out more about us and, and want to learn more, so we're excited about that as well. And then um, we just happened to have the extra unit that we didn't put at Les Paul at this point um, just because of readiness and, and scalability. And that unit, we were like, well, let's not just let it sit, so let's put it in 210 and people stop by and pick salad for lunch or grab some cilantro for home. And it's been a great way to get the word out and, and people... Well, Stacy's husband now has a small garden as a result. Um, so it is really, it's it's kind of a fun way to, it's almost like the water cooler of uh, Blair now where people come and check things out and it's the salad cooler. <laughs> um, we've made some herbed butter. Um, I'm trying to think what, it's just been a, a really fun partnership and it's really neat to see that all these different groups can partner together um, our science teachers are getting interested. Our ecology club kids are like, how do I get in? So we're starting to see so much connection happening that we just have to make sure we go slow enough that we can maintain this pace. Um, Erica alluded to the fi financial implications. All of the work that we've done so far has been fully grant funded or donated. We've been busy grant writers, busy grant writers, um, and we've been very graciously um, supported in that work from multiple different sources, including WEF, including Spring City, including Fork Farms. Um, and then we also have donations that come in. And we did some math, which is not my strong point, but we made a spreadsheet to calculate what we've been harvesting, which we do keep track of, the students weigh, as you can see in the top corner, they're actually weighing what they harvest, and comparing that like for like if you went to buy it at pick and save or metro market. And if you look at the, the harvest value 
what we actually paid out in seed and nutrient costs, we're netting a, a significant amount of money. So if Work Farm says it takes about five years to pay for the unit, I don't think it will take us that long based on the amount of production and consumption that's happening in our classrooms. Yes, this is me. Uh, <laughs> so we already talked a little bit about some of our future goals. One has just started last week, um, composting. We don't have, don't worry, we don't have composts like at school. Uh, but we've, by a weird, this is how weird our jobs are now, I reached out and found a pig farmer that wants our scrap. And so he supplied buckets with lids, and we started last week with our very first pickup of just vegetable and fruit scraps. And he took them home, and he fed the pigs, and there's, he, he picks it up outside, and it's amazing. And we want to continue growing that because, again, it's, a, it's neutral, it's benefiting us, and you know what? who else it's benefiting is buildings and grounds because those, those bags get really heavy really quickly. So... Ultimately, we'd like to see this move forward beyond our, just our culinary classrooms. We really do think that composting and separating waste can be something really simple that we can add into our lunchroom programs. Rose Glenn is piloting it right now as well. Um, establishing more community con connections. We're doing that um, soon at North. We're hosting another lunch, but we're hosting it for community members to come out and really see what's happening. So members of Spring City Garden Club, some other farmers in the area, a, nutri a microgreen company, um, some other family and consumer science teachers from the area. They're all coming in to see what it is that we're doing because they, they want to duplicate this. Erica already said uh, all of the teachers would take another flex farm unit. It's just what can we handle, house, and maintain. Um, Erica's team has done a lot of work with green teams and, and we're starting to see like AP Environmental Science, they're reaching out to us, they're actually going to do a composting event as well. So we're starting to again see that, that um, cross-curricular planning happening. Our dream at some point is to rope in Airmark. They are completely on board with how could they potentially use some of the ingredients that we can produce in their lunchroom. So it's just a, developing a system that we all can maintain happily in our ecosystem. And then Erica's work with the district gardening. Many of our schools have on-site gardens and sometimes it becomes, I like a garden so I'm gonna have a garden. Oh, I leave, I don't have a garden anymore. So coming up with a systematic way of maintaining those gardens, keeping those gardens going, Establishing a system so that we're not all growing all of the things. Perhaps one school grows one thing, another school, school grows something, and then they share. So creating that kind of ecosystem and, and community within our own system, gardening. And I think this is, it, it speaks to where we're at when we talk about, you know, the water cooler of our, of our, of our hydroponic unit. It, food brings people together and sharing who we are and who our cultures are and through our cooking and our food has been kind of the best part of this is we've made connections with people we wouldn't have normally made connections with because of this. And I think that is why we're so grateful and so happy with what we've been doing. And it's, it's nice to have just something that has been so positive mm -hmm. um, and time with students. And it's just been amazing. So we're really thankful for the ability to do this and to share it with you. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to come and try some of our food again in the future. Well, I will just kick it off. Um, the luncheon that um, the students hosted was a really nice way of showcasing all the pieces. And so it was a great celebration. The food was delicious. You know, Mrs. Voigt was there and Mr. Moore. Um, and I, I know that there was quite a bit of effort that went into to having that. So I um, appreciate it. Um, but just... Um, you know, having known about some of these things but not seeing it all come together, I think that was the impressive part was how it really is um, underscoring different parts of curriculum and getting the kids excited about bringing all of that together. So it was very impressive and um, just learned a lot in the process. So I fired up, fired up my arrow garden again, although it lasts about a week and it's gone. Um, we, know, we know some people that can help you. Need the bigger one, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'll turn it over to the rest of the committee if there's any questions or comments. Mrs. Koslowski. I've never regretted not being able to make that lunch more than I do tonight. <laughs> <laughs> it was delicious. 
Uh, did I I'm tell a, you how delicious it was? Yes, it was you did. Great. Multiple <laughs> times. Uh, I'm a big gardener. Uh, so this is this is up my alley and watching it and just seeing how sustainable and, and teaching kids about that. Um, I, I'm just impressed. So I'm looking forward to another invite where I can actually attend because I do like to eat as well. Uh, but this is, this is really cool. Thank you. Mr. Zenobia. Uh, a couple things. Um, so you had mentioned that there was, uh, I don't know if I'd call it a profit, but the sustainability are some of the students selling some of this produce, or how is that being measured? I'm just curious if this is branching into... No, not it, it's not a profit necessarily, it's just more of we have access to more ingredients than we would have in the past. Like this, okay. would, we, we saved that money in our budget. And, and in some of the partnerships that you, you mentioned, are there... I, I guess what I'm, I'm driving at is I know you said that there really isn't a, a curriculum in place for some of these kids maybe to catapult into this area, but that maybe that's the goal, correct? And, yes. And so with some of these other um, opportunities, uh, do you see some of that involvement creating that, or what's kind of the, the vision or the plan to, to do that? So currently we do have students, you know, interested in culinary arts as a pathway, and they, they do go into, you know, hospitality and tourism type careers. We, what I'm now seeing is students actually interested in, like, the science side of it, um, as well as just, like, the main, maintaining of it. Um, so we actually have a student, just one example at West High School next year, that that's, she wants that to be her co-op or internship job, is to just manage that system and help the teacher kind of offshore some of that. She, the teacher is not a plant person, so it helps um, by all means. But ultimately, I mean, we, we, would, we want to bring in those partners to help build out some of those career pathways that we don't really have a lot of established curriculum on. So Gwendolyn Hills is a great partner. They're willing to host tours. They're willing to come in and speak to our students about farming and farm science and ag practices so i don't see it being something that's we're shying away from it's just where does it fit right. that's not good is it right okay we're okay <laughs> okay and i think i honestly i think that's the benefit of molly's and i role is that we we connect people so for example um the teacher at south in the environmental studies class he does a, a big project where students have to do some sort of sustainable project um, and i was able to connect him with rose glenn for next year's progress uh, project because they're looking at doing making that hill that is steep and no one wants to mow into a sustainable like prairie system that we won't have to mow anymore so connecting those people together that normally wouldn't know each other to to do that it's just kind of what we're able to do in this role i think has been helpful thank you well, thank you very much for the update thank, thank you. you for having us Okay. As long as we're not going to blow away. That's... Our next item on the agenda is um, an update to the high school schedule. As we transition, uh, do we need do we need to did you, did you temporarily have hold the meeting or where where are we at? I didn't get the alert, so I'm not sure either. what. What we're looking we're at. Western Waukesha County. Okay. Uh, are we Western? Middle? middle or middle? What does the handbook say? Seems like it was short. Straight line winds near Palmyra, eight miles east of Whitewater. So um, just um, for those who may be following along with me, seeing as we are under a tornado warning um, and I'm seeing on my radar that um, some rain and thunder starting in the next 15, 20 minutes, um, should we just, does anybody have access to a radar? I'm looking at a radar. I, 
I don't know that we're any uh, immediate danger. I mean, it's not. It's not really trending. Our why way don't Why don't we continue? Um, we we know what the security or what the safety protocols are in this building. If we were to hear the tornado sirens, so okay. All right. Hi. Now you're on the clock. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, hi, I'm Laura Ryan. I am the director of high school teaching and learning, and I am here tonight to kind of give you a brief historical review of where we have been with the high school schedule um, and transitioning into a block and the update of where we've been since um, our team was last here. So just um, a historical, again, refresh. Um, uh, last year, there was a team who began investigating various high school schedules um, and basically to, to meet these priorities. So they were looking at um, some various schedules. That want, they wanted something that was student-centered. They wanted to try to increase instructional minutes by still um, supporting the fidelity to the curriculum. Really a high priority was to manage workloads for both teachers and students. The priority of staying within the existing times and of always continuing student-centered programming. Um, so just a timeline here that I'll jump back and forth to. So in the spring of 2023 um, of last year, they had done this work. You can see um, that team um, had evaluated alternative schedules. They had weighed the pros and cons of several different high school schedules, and they had collected teacher, parent, student, and community feedback. And there was a team of teachers and administrators um, who were really looking into these um, different schedules. By the summer of 2022, Three, that team had solidified um, that the desire to transition to a four period A day and four period B day schedule um, that looked like this. Okay, so I think it would be appropriate if we um, adjourn the meeting. And then, um, depending on how long this takes, we can readjourn. Okay, since we're hearing. All right, well, it's just me um, back in the boardroom, and due to um, the severe weather warnings, we have adjourned the Teaching and Learning Committee meeting for tonight. So um, we will move those discussion items to a future uh, committee meeting agenda. Our next meeting will, our next Teaching and Learning Committee meeting will be on Tuesday, June 4th here in the boardroom. So we're adjourned for this evening.